Hello, my name is Nicole McKinsey and I'm with SADA Systems. I'll be your moderator today for our webinar, How to Stop Your Next DDoS Attack in Under Five Minutes. Uh, we have speakers here today from Reblaze and SADA Systems and we'll be beginning our presentation shortly. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Please keep your phones on mute. And if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to put them in the questions box and they will be answered at the end. We have speakers from Reblaze, which is, uh, we have Spiros, he is the product manager, and we also have Suri, who is the founder and CTO, and on the SADA system side, we have Simon, who is our director of cloud. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Spiros for the presentation. Spiros? Well, thank you. Welcome, everybody, uh, to our webinar here. Uh, you just heard the speaker introduction. I am the guy over here on the right, and Simon and Suri will be part of the webinar later. Uh, they're the two experts and heavy hitters in this field, so uh, feel free to ask whatever questions you have as the subject comes up. Uh, our topic here today is, of course, DDoS attacks. A uh, brief overview of what we'll be talking about. First, we'll discuss current attack trends, uh, both the size and the frequencies that we're seeing now and what this tells us for outlook for the future. We'll talk about four reasons why DDoS attacks are becoming so frequent today. Uh, there's three common responses that most organizations use to respond to a DDoS attack. And unfortunately, these responses, these reactions aren't working anymore. We'll talk briefly about why that is. And then we'll uh, talk about how to use the cloud to stop a DDoS in five minutes or less, as the topic of this webinar promised. So the first item here is what's going on today with DDoS. Uh, we see here that the size of DDoS attacks has really taken a sharp leap here in the past few years. You see from 2006 to 2012, there were a few bumps here and there, uh, but attacks were still fairly low in their maximum size. The last few years, though, has seen a sharp increase in this, and there's several reasons for this. Uh, last year's 1.2 terabit attack uh, on, in 2016 was mostly driven by a new botnet taking advantage of the Internet of Things. And if you follow this, uh, this field, you'll probably be familiar with that. Uh, that's not the only trend at play here, though. There's several reasons why attacks are getting as large as they are. They're not only getting large, though, they're also getting very frequent. Arbor Networks runs a regular survey on data center operators to find out how frequently they're getting attacked and what the attacks look like. And as you can see here, 70% of data centers are experiencing at least one monthly attack up to 10 attacks per month. 13% uh, of data center operators are seeing 11 to 20 attacks per month, and the remainder are seeing even more frequently than this. And this isn't limited to data centers, uh, of course. Uh, attack frequency does vary a bit depending on the industry. Uh, here at Reblaze, we have a, a client that gets attacked hourly. And so point is here, uh, if you haven't been attacked recently, you probably will soon. These attacks are getting very common. Here we go. Trends for the future. Akamai State of the Internet report for the first quarter had some interesting comments on this, uh, discussing the current capabilities of the Mirai botnet network, which was involved in several of the large-scale attacks uh, this past year. They're expecting attack sizes of up to two terabits per second here in the near future. Uh, these botnets are getting large, but we haven't even seen them being used to their full capabilities yet. As this uh, quote mentions, if these networks gain unfettered internet access, the devices could be capable of emitting 20 times more attack, more attack traffic, excuse me, than we've seen to date. Now, the size of these attacks tends to be what makes the headlines in the news and so on. But if you think about this, the size of the attacks isn't really the worst concern with this. To cause a problem for your organization, an attack doesn't really need to be large. It just needs to be large enough, right? 10 gigabits per second is often enough to cause major problems for many organizations. And for example, the large attack last year of 1.2 terabits, the resources for that could have been used to mount 120 10 gigabit per second attacks. So as these uh, attackers are starting to use their resources more efficiently and more effectively, uh, this is one of the things driving a large, larger frequency, a more common nature of these attacks. And indeed, we're also seeing multi-vector attacks becoming increasingly common. It's not merely that volumetric attacks are being used to overwhelm 
uh, incoming internet pipes now, we're also seeing uh, volumetric and application layer attacks happening at the same time, which of course is much more of a challenge for mitigation. So we see the, uh, the current trends in this field, uh, increasing size, increasing frequency, and both of those promise to get worse here in the future. So let's talk about why, some of the reasons why these attacks are getting as common as they are. Well, there's four primary reasons for this. Uh, the first is that attack resources are getting to be very abundant and cheap. Uh, large scale attacks can now be mounted and launched very cheaply for the attacker. For example, the DIN attack in 2016 in October, uh, this took down Amazon, Netflix, Reddit, and some very large sites. Reportedly, that cost the attacker only $7,500 to do that. And not only is it cheap to mount attacks now, it's also more lucrative to do so. As the internet has become more commercialized, we're seeing ransom attacks uh, play a very large role in uh, hacking uh, activity because it has a very high potential payoff. An example of this, the VDOS network had, uh, we now know, only two people operating it. They were both teenagers. Uh, they were arrested recently, which is why uh, we know this. And they earned $600,000 over a two year period. So if two teenagers can earn $300,000 over two years, you can see that there's a very um, potential uh, payoff for this type of activity, especially for larger well-financed uh, criminal rings as well. In addition to this, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin mean monetization is no longer a challenge. Now, historically, attacking always raised the question of how are you going to get paid from your illicit activities? Well, the cryptocurrencies make payment anonymous now. That means criminals and attackers can get paid anonymously, and that makes it much more easy to receive the payoff from their activities without causing them problems later. The third reason is more sophisticated malware. With the potential financial rewards being so high, there's obviously intense competition among malware de developers. Uh, there's entire marketplaces on the dark net where developers are offering their services and various attack packages. It's not only a competition to offer more effective and sophisticated malware, there's even competition among them to create software that's easier to use. And put all this together, you wind up with a situation that we're seeing now where attack services are basically a commodity. There's a mature marketplace here. Stressors and booters, meaning uh, services offering to quote unquote stress your network, in other words, to attack someone else's network while claiming you're only stressing your own, uh, this means attackers don't, not, don't need to be technologically savvy anymore. You don't need to mount the attack yourself. You can hire a service to do it for you. And as an example here, the DIN attack was actually collateral damage from an angry gamer who was trying to take down the PlayStation network. That's the one that took down Amazon, Netflix, Reddit, etc. This is somebody trying to take down a very specific um, set of sites and instead took down a good chunk of the internet for a not insignificant length of time. So if someone can do that basically accidentally, that tells you how easy this is getting. So this is uh, the reasons that DDoS attacks are becoming so frequent today. Now the problem is most organizations are still responding in ways that don't work anymore. So the three most common responses and why they're ineffective today, uh, first of all, most organizations are still relying on an appliance or firewall or an IPS system to defend them. Reason, <clears throat> excuse me, response number two is to rely on an I, your ISP or some other hosting provider to provide defenses for you. Or response number three is just trying to outlast the attacker. So let's talk about these. Relying on an appliance doesn't really work anymore. First of all, it's a significant expense to have this hardware. Uh, that, of course, uh, was a downside. Operating them is difficult, too. They're difficult to administer, and they require continual maintenance and patching. The threat environment on the internet is changing constantly. So if your appliances are going to be effective in defending against attacks, they have to be updated frequently. Also, they can't necessarily defend against some newer forms of attack. I discussed a moment ago, multi-vector attacks are becoming increasingly common. And in any case, they're not really addressing one of the primary routes of a DDS. A volumetric DDoS attack will saturate the incoming internet pipe even before the traffic reaches the appliance. So even if the appliance filters the traffic before it reaches your actual network, 
it can still saturate your incoming pipe and cause problems for you anyway. So relying on appliances doesn't really work anymore. What about relying on your service provider? Uh, some service providers advertise DDoS defense as part of their offerings, while many of these can't defend against application layer attacks, as we talked about before. Uh, many attacks are a combination now. Almost all service providers are only offering shared resource environments. That means even if you aren't attacked, you can still be affected by an attack aimed at someone else that you're sharing resources with. And large enough volumetric attacks will often overwhelm these providers anyway. An example here, the cloud hosting provider Linode was hit uh, with a large number of concurrent volumetric attacks. Their response, and I'm quoting their blog post here, was to use a tool we use to protect ourselves called remote triggered black holing. When an IP address is black holed, the internet collectively agrees to drop all traffic destined to that IP address, preventing both good and bad traffic from reaching it. Black holing is a blunt but crucial weapon in our arsenal, giving us the ability to cut off a finger to save the hand, that is to sacrifice the customer who was being attacked in order to keep the others online. Now they were presenting this as if this was a good solution, but if you were the customer being attacked, then you were the finger who was cut off to save the hand. That's not very comforting, is it? I'll also note here that their response to this attack was basically to surrender to the attacker. The victims of this attack, their traffic was black told, those sites were knocked off the internet. That's exactly what the attacker wanted to accomplish. So the solution by this hosting provider was in effect to surrender to the attacker and give the attacker exactly what he was trying to accomplish. Now, I'm not trying to criticize this particular provider specifically, uh, a lot of providers do this because the size of attacks, as we saw earlier, is getting so overwhelming now that a typical uh, hosting provider cannot handle it. So the third option is sort of the default then after the first two fail. That's trying to outlast the attacker. Basically, you suffer the effects of the attack, waiting for the attacker to call it off, basically uh, waiting until he gets tired of it all. Now, it's easy to see why this often happens because attacks are getting more sophisticated and they're frequently difficult to diagnose. Oftentimes, if you're the victim of an attack, you don't really know what's happening. You see all this traffic coming in, you don't know which traffic is legitimate and which is attack traffic, and so it's difficult to know what to do. But this, uh, this strategy, uh, presented as a mitigation strategy sometimes, is really an act of desperation. Uh, this is not the proper response you're essentially ensuring you're locking in whatever damage to your brand and reputation that you're going to experience as a result of this attack. Uh, you're gonna have loss of revenue, loss of customer goodwill, and probable loss of customers to competitors. Some of the attackers are getting very sophisticated now, rather than launching one large scale attack to overwhelm an organization all at once, they'll do it in short bursts. Uh, they'll do it long enough to ensure that whatever customers are trying to access the site are having problems. Then they'll stop the attack briefly so that customers try to use it again, and then they'll revert back to the uh, previous attack. Uh, this is especially prevalent in the gaming industry, where customers log into a server and are uh, have a, a long-term session for a while. The attackers are logging, or uh, rather, launching attacks to knock all the users off of the server and then waiting a, a bit for the users to try to log back in and then knocking them off again. And doing this progressively is a way of making the users, the customers, angrier and angrier and more and more frustrated until they are driven off to the competitors. And this also, the strategy, this uh, default tactic here, also ignores the high motivation and persistence of today's attackers who can often sustain and repeat attacks with little cost. Example here, the uh, DD4BC extortion group has attacked uh, some specific targets dozens of times. Once they realize you have no defense other than trying to outlast them, they can come back again and again as part of their approach. So we see then DDoS is a much um, larger problem than it has been in the past and it's getting worse. We can expect it to be more and more frequent and more and more problematic we see that the historic responses to this don't really work anymore. So what does work? Well, let's talk about how to use the cloud then, uh, today's cloud technologies, to actually shut down a DDoS in five minutes or less, even one that's in progress when you first start to do this. 
So what are the requirements for effective DDoS mitigation then, if you want to use the cloud or some other technology to do this? Well, you need to be capable of defeating even sophisticated multi-vector attacks. Uh, you don't want a solution that uses a shared resource environment. You want resources dedicated ex exclusively to your use so that you're not affected by attacks on any other customers. Ideally, you want something that's easy to use. You want something that's updated automatically so you're not having to continually try to uh, keep up with what the attackers are doing. You want something that scrubs the traffic before it even reaches your incoming internet pipe. You want, ideally, something that would leverage the bandwidth of the global cloud. I mean, the attackers have some large-scale botnets now that they have access to. You need a large amount of bandwidth to deal with this, and the largest available is the global cloud. You would like this solution to be presented as a low-cost software as a service. Uh, ideally, there would be no large upfront investment required, and you want something that can be effectively deployed even during an ongoing DDoS attack. So that's what Reblaze was designed to do. Uh, Reblaze is not limited to only protecting against DDoS. It's a comprehensive web security solution. But in the context of DDoS here, it's useful to talk about how this works. Uh, Reblaze is a software platform that runs in the cloud and all incoming traffic is routed to Reblaze before it is passed through to your web server. So as you see in the diagram here, incoming traffic uh, must pass through a Reblaze gateway on the way to your web server. Attack traffic is filtered out before it reaches the web server, and so only legitimate traffic passes through. Now, you might think this would uh, introduce additional latency. That's not the case. Reblaze can run in the cloud right in front of your server, and due to a CDN integration and some other things, uh, generally, or at least uh, quite a few times, uh, quite a large percentage of the time, customers actually experience an increase in perceived site responsiveness to their users after deploying this. So Reblaze fulfills all the criteria that I described to you here a moment ago. It's capable of defeating even sophisticated attacks, again, DDoS and other forms of attacks as well. Uh, you do not share resources with any other customers. Reblaze deploys a virtual private cloud for each customer, or for that matter, each network. We have customers that have multiple deployments to uh, um, firewall, in a sense, each network even further. It's very easy to use. It's updated automatically and remotely managed, so there's no burden on your staff. Again, it scrubs the traffic before it reaches your incoming internet pipe, so volumetric attacks are not an issue. You have the bandwidth of the global cloud available to you. Reblaze scales automatically as needed, so as an attacker ratchets up his bandwidth trying to knock you off the internet, Reblaze ratchet, ratchets up its bandwidth in response to that. It's available as a low-cost software as a service, much less expensive than appliances, and no large initial investment as appliances required. And relevant to the to topic of our webinar here, it can be deployed even during an ongoing DDoS attack. We have many customers who have contacted us as the result of being attacked, saying, what do I do? Well, here's how to stop a DDoS in under five minutes using these cloud technologies that we're talking about. Deploying Reblaze for your site takes approximately 60 seconds. It generally takes a couple minutes on the phone to get the necessary information. The actual deployment takes about a minute. Then you change your DNS settings to route your incoming traffic to the Reblaze platform, and then you're done. The whole process takes literally just a few minutes. At that point, DDoS traffic stops. The attack itself, of course, is continuing in the background, but your network will never see it, and your users will never be affected as a result of it. So Reblaze has numerous advantages besides the ones described here. Uh, it's a comprehensive solution, as I've mentioned. Uh, we use top-tier cloud infrastructure. There's an overall architecture uh, behind that that I won't take the time to describe today. Uh, we do use machine intelligence behavior analysis. It's not merely that we're leveraging the bandwidth of the cloud. We're levering machine intelligence and machine learning to actually uh, learn what the attackers are doing and adapt to their latest attack vectors. Uh, as I mentioned previously, it is a comprehensive solution. Denial of service and uh, distributed denial of service are not the only things you protect against. It's all forms of web security are um, included here fully managed and re maintained remotely by Reblaze personnel, as I mentioned, and it's always up to date. You don't have to worry about patches, testing, and all the rest of it. 
Additional benefits as well, and I'm just going to skim over these briefly, Relays provides full transparency into your traffic. It's no longer a question of what is going on. You see exactly what's coming into your, your network. You see what's allowed, what's being blocked. You see why. And there's a lot of analytics uh, available to you now that was not available previously. It also runs on the top tier cloud infrastructures uh, uh, available on the internet today. Other cloud web security solutions use self-owned infrastructure. That, of course, cannot compete with the top tier providers, which is what Reblaze runs on. So the clouds you already trust for your other business processes can also be used to provide web security as well. I've mentioned previously that each Reblaze customer gets a virtual private cloud, uh, one or more for that matter. As I mentioned before, you can deploy more than one if you want to have a finer granularity, whereas other solutions include co-location vulnerabilities because you're sharing resources with others. I believe I mentioned previously that bandwidth scales automatically and other benefits here as well. And I'm gonna skip forward a bit in the interest of time. Reblaze is also provided on a trial basis so that you can try this without any risk at all. You can deploy Reblaze as an additional layer of security on top of your existing solutions so you don't need to affect what you're currently using. You can even deploy it in report only mode where Reblaze won't actually filter any traffic. It will only report on the traffic it would have filtered. This allows you the reassurance to see that there's no false positives uh, coming in. And there's nothing to install. Uh, you can activate Reblaze for any site or web application in minutes, and there's no obligation to, uh, to, do any, to continue with Reblaze after you've tried it. If after one month you aren't delighted with what you're receiving with Reblaze, you can cancel your account and you will owe nothing. So a summary of what Reblaze offers is here. I've discussed these things previously, so I won't go through them again. And at this point in the presentation, I'm going to turn things over to Simon Margolis from SATA Systems, who has some additional things he wants to talk about. Simon? Great, thank you so much for that, and uh, happy to be speaking to all of you here today. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about who SATA Systems are, uh, a little bit about my role, myself, and sort of how we work with Reblaze, and on top of that, the services that we offer um, in the cloud space in general. So SATA Systems is one of the original launch partners within uh, the Google partner ecosystem. Uh, we, we were one of the North American launch partners back in the year 2007, and have been very proud to be what Google calls a premier partner ever since. Uh, basically, that's a measure of our ability to support customers, give the quote-unquote white glove treatment, and ensure that um, our customers and mutual clients are able to take the most advantage of the cloud platform um, possible. So there's a few call-outs here on this slide I don't want to go too deep into, but um, just a few of the things that we're kind of most proud of. Um, we've migrated over 20 million users to the cloud, um, with consisting of over 2,400 different customers, um, and that's over 2,000 complete projects. Um, now, as far as kind of where we engage, and the next slide we'll talk a little bit more about that, we can talk about kind of how we work with our customers and what our offerings really look like. Um, naturally, a lot of that has to do with what we provide in conjunction with Reblaze, um, and I certainly don't want to slight that at all, and there, there, so we'll certainly talk about that in, in a later slide here, but kind of want to give the overview first, which is to say there's three major areas uh, at a high level that we work with our customers in. So the first sort of top level area is within readiness and planning for cloud. Um, this isn't necessarily for organizations that are not yet in the cloud, um, but this is for organizations that are considering um, advanced use of the cloud, uh, considering additional cloud platforms, um, or you know, considering making the first steps into adopting cloud in general. Um, and so we do a lot with our customers around that phase in terms of planning for a migration, planning for a multi-cloud architecture, and understanding what the cost benefit analysis looks like for such a migration. So um, our team, our, our consultants, as well as our technology is able to really analyze an existing environment and talk about the pros, cons, and just paradigm shifts that would be associated with making a shift to the cloud in general. Um, the kind of natural next step to that is in migration. And though that's the kind of buzzword and easiest way to put it, what it really is is more of migration and transformation. So 
you know, we do offer what you'd call traditional lift and shift migration. We take infrastructure, we take stuff from on premises or from an existing cloud platform and move them into Google Cloud Platform. Um, but we really see that as kind of the first step. And that certainly doesn't paint the entire picture. It's just a means to an end. And what we mean by transformation is really looking at the way an application or infrastructure is architected and ensuring that it's being done in a way that makes it the most cloud friendly, or as we like to say, the most Googly uh, way possible. So this means maybe taking advantage of what Google calls managed services. Um, for example, instead of having to manage and maintain running a virtual machine, Google has a number of offerings that will handle a lot of those maintenance and day-to-day -day tasks for you, um, allowing you to focus on what you actually care about, which is you know, running your business and um, you know, adding you know, whatever value that you in particularly bring to it, not worrying about keeping the lights on. Um, and though after that migration, uh, SADA certainly does not go away. So we do have a 24 by seven US-based support desk and we're able to provide ongoing support as well as human managed services. So this is kind of filling in the gap between where Google's technology leaves off and that last mile of human interaction. Um, a lot of times there's a good case to be made where you don't wanna dedicate your resources to round the clock standby coverage for something that may go wrong. And so as a result, Google or SADA does offer that and we have the ability to you make sure to stay in regular communication with the customer as well as escalation support to Google engineering uh, when things do go wrong. So we can dive a little bit deeper on the next slide here into sort of some of SADA's actual solutions that we architect. This is where, typically this is something that comes as a step beyond the actual implementation and migration of a Google Cloud Platform environment we then look at what can we do in order to build cloud native solutions that can behoove your business. Um, and so I don't wanna to go too deep on all of these, but it's kind of a good overview just of the type of things that we do offer. Um, and with all of these kind of offerings, what they really are are enhancements of Google existing products and services. So we like to talk about Google Cloud Platform as being a box of tools. And so in many cases, SADA has found that our customers um, would like to take advantage of some of these tools, but because they are just tools and not fully built out solutions, uh, the desire is to have something that's a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more ready to use out of the box. Um, and so, you know, a good example is on the far left here, this translation overlay. Google has an extremely powerful translation API. Um, and this is based on Google's machine learning and their neural networks. So it's a highly advanced, very intelligent translation tool, great quality translations. However, you interface with it, as you would imagine, just via an API, you provide your language to translate and what language, you know, what content you'd like to have translated, and it returns that back to you, very straightforward. What we found was that many businesses need a little bit more than that. For example, there may be acronyms or custom language that's unique to the, in the industry or maybe unique to um, that organization in particular. And so what we're able to do is bake in those nuances into a overlay API so that the organization is able to just work with this API, know that it already knows everything that it, that it needs to know about that organization and can produce just what the end user is looking for. So that's an example, like I mentioned, of just where SOD is coming in, enhancing, making modification to these base layer things, uh, these tools that Google provides in order to provide something that is more truly meaningful um, to the organization. And again, I don't wanna go over all of these, but just at an extremely high level, um, intelligent media warehouse, an enhancement on Google's um, both mapping as well as their vision intelligence machine learning tools, um, sentiment analysis, again, an enhancement of Google's natural language processing API, um, and then the intelligent automated customer service. Again, this is an enhancement of what Google calls API.ai, where we're leveraging Google's um, artificial intelligence API to train based on customers' data so that you're getting a AI experience for your end users based on your unique environment. And so that's kind of what we do in terms of kind of these, these custom built solutions. What I'm most excited I think to talk about here is what comes on the next slide, um, which is really around SADA's managed service offerings. And so I'll go briefly over all of these just in the sense that what SADA does on top of managing the cloud itself 
is work with an ecosystem of partners that represent key areas of additional value to the cloud that we feel our customers uh, really should take a look at, if not so far as to say they need in order to really experience the best possible um, experience on the platform. And so you see from a monitoring perspective, uh, Stackdriver did used to be an independent third party that we'd bring in. Um, within the last few years, Google actually did acquire Stackdriver. Um, and so now we do refer them for all of our customers. We find that they make the absolute best when it comes to deep integration and alerting on top of Google Cloud Platform. Same goes for Orbitera on the far right. Uh, used to be a independent third party that we worked with regularly, now has been acquired by Google as well, and provides really, really deep, uh, fine-grained billing analysis and management um, for Google Cloud Platform as well as for other cloud providers. And so it sort of gives you this single pane of glass. Um, so with Stackdriver, with Orbitera, obviously these are uh, kind of, you, you, you know, you could imagine no-brainers when it comes to working with the cloud. You need to have monitoring alerting, you need to have a way to manage your billing and, and make sure that costs are allocated. Um, and we find this is true for Reblaze as well. And that's really why you know, we're excited to be here today talking with them to all of you. It's becoming one of those no brainers based on you know, everything that Spiros just sort of went over that you need to be taking into account your, your security when, when deploying in the cloud. Um, I think in the old paradigm, it was kind of assumed that by moving to a cloud provider, you no longer had to worry about these things, that the cloud provider simply took care of them for you. Obviously, we we're learning that this is, this is certainly not the case, and it's really a shared responsibility model in the cloud. Um, this is true of Google, as well as all the other uh, major cloud providers in the space. And so, as a result, we've seen just massive customer success by adopting Reblaze technology. And so, the portion that sort of SADA plays in all of this is in the ongoing management and maintenance of Reblaze. Um, so as we can see, you know, Reblaze is very straightforward, very easy to use, very easy to deploy. That being said, just like with Stackdriver, just like with Orbitera, and just like with Google Cloud Platform in general, there will be occasions where there's notifications or information that needs to be updated, and in some cases may require some type of input, intervention, um, or simply just a review to make sure that things are behaving the way we expect them to. Um, and so that's, that's the service that SADA really provides. And in partnering with Reblaze, we're able to make sure that we are the single phone call that you would need to make if anything does happen to your Google Cloud Platform environment, whether it's related to the underlying Google technology, whether it's related to your application in particular, or whether it's related to Reblaze and the overall security of your application, um, SADA is able to assist and maintain anything that may go wrong across those products. And so as you can imagine, we've had, we've had just fantastic success working with Reblaze on that. Um, and naturally, whenever we are able to sort of show its value to a customer, especially one that is suffering one of the ailments um, that are common to sort of massively targeted cloud applications, um, you know, this always creates a much greater experience for the end customer and naturally for their end users as well. Okay, and we also wanted to extend an offer to the attendees or the later viewers of this webinar. Uh, as a viewer or attendee, uh, Reblaze will give you 25% off the cost of Reblaze's web security solution. That's for the lifetime of your use of Reblaze. This also includes the one month free trial offer um, that was mentioned previously. Also, uh, for attendees or viewers, $500 in Google Cloud Platform credits. Whether you're an existing GCP user or you want to start moving to GCP, $500 in credits for your use of that. And both of these offers are available to you if you send an email to Google Sales at satisystems.com and mention that you saw this webinar. Now we have just a few minutes left uh, for Q&A with Simon and Suri. Nicole, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. We actually have one that came in about mid-webinar asking, um, I don't know if you guys are able to discuss this on the webinar, but uh, Reblaze's pricing model. Hi, thank you, Nicole. Um, Reblaze's pricing model is derived from the scale and complexity of the protected platform. Mainly speaking, the, um, the, the, the amount of traffic being transferred throughout the cloud platform we, we set for the customer as well as uh, um, 
the number of web applications we're protecting. That's basically how we uh, build the price. Um, as mentioned, it's a monthly uh, subscription base, so you pay month to month, no need for down payments for uh, intensive investment for to get Reblaze up and running. Uh, this is Spiros again. One thing that I don't believe I mentioned earlier, Reblaze is also unusual in that there's no long-term contract, contractual obligations with our customers. All of our customers are month to month. Awesome, thank you. This question is actually, I think, could act, could be geared towards both um, Simon and Surrey. So if you could each uh, answer this in terms of both Reblaze and it looks like Angie CP, what kind of um, compliance does the product have when it comes to things like HIPAA? Is are Google and Reblaze both um, compliant with regulated industries? Okay, so from Reblaze's point of view. Um, we run on a cloud which is already compliance, um, that be it a GCP with all these certificates and compliance you can find at uh, Google Cloud uh, Compliance uh, landing page. As well, Reblaze product itself has a PCI um, level one and two and is it uh, 27001 and uh, soon enough uh, SOC 2 compliance. Sure, yeah, and I can I can comment on the Sade and Google side as well. Uh, just as Suri mentions, um, Google Cloud Platform is compliant with a number of certifications, um, SOC 1 and 2, of course. Um, same goes for HIPAA and uh, PCI compliance on almost all of their products. I do caveat that with saying almost all of their products. There are always a few um, newer products, alpha or beta products, which haven't yet been officially certified. Um, and so as such, we can't say all, um, but um, we do have customers that run extremely sensitive workloads across the board. Um, and sort of to put our money where our mouth is as well, SADA also holds a SOC 2 certification um, to ensure that while we're working with you, um, touching your data or whatever it may be, um, are also being held to a very high level of security and privacy. Thank you very much. And it looks like we have one last question. And if you have any questions, please put them in the question box and we can answer them before we go today. Uh, the last question, I think this is for you, Suri, is that are the data log and logs aggregated available for end users? And if so, in what way? Oh, great. So uh, we make the data available for you throughout uh, several platforms. One is the Reblaze Management Console, which allows you to um, uh, go through the data, um, you can go in time and select specific data that you would like to see, attacks, suspicious traffic, legitimate traffic, it's filtered traffic by country, by any parameter, IP, et cetera, and so on. Uh, other than that, we offer the data. Uh, data is available to you through an API, so you get full access to your BigQuery instance of Reblaze that is dedicated for US bureaus, as mentioned. There is a complete separation in Reblaze, and you can um, get a data export to any uh, format, any data format. You can even do, use Google Data Labs, this very cool tool Google put out for free for data scientists. So you can run very uh, interesting queries and analyze the data from uh, different angles and get some insights and understanding, a better understanding of your data and information. Uh, other than that, uh, we also make the data available in the live real-time streaming over syslog uh, uh, to your existing SIEM or SOC solution. So you can get all the data available to your existing uh, log aggregation and analysis platforms if you have one. So that basically means that all the data Reblaze is being analyzed and handled throughout the service lifetime is available for you and there is no log retention in Reblaze and we keep all the logs and all the data all the time so you can always go back in time and analyze and get all the information you need. All right, let me see if there's any more questions. I think that concludes our questions for the webinar. And of course, if you have additional questions, you can still reach out to the Google sales at thoughtassistance.com and we can route it to the proper person for you to assist you. Um, as well, if you would like more information on um, Reblaze and to request a demo, you can visit Reblaze's website at reblaze.com. 
Um, so thank you very much for joining our webinar today. We have recorded the session today and a recording will be available to attendees. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.